for you and say, uh, the last five minutes to conclude, the claim the scarf was born, was long before the nation court had set, long before the declaration, the proclamation of an election, and then long before anything like candidates existed in 2018 for this year's election. So today take conduct done prior to the existence of candidates in the 2018 election and say it shows you are aligned to that candidate because when that candidate eventually did his election uh, run, he used that clothing for that election run. It is with respect mischievous. It is to put the cart before the horse. There is no way you can say something that happened five months ago was not related by something that then happened five months subsequent. The logic doesn't hold up. And we say so in the affidavit. There is no basis to claim that there was bias on the part of the 24th respondent on that score. It is just something that is there in the papers, perhaps to make them larger, but not really to put any substance to them, with all due respect. The question of the post of vote that has been put across, I think that misstates the figures. He says there were 7,500 police officers that voted through the post. That's not correct. And we put across the proper post of voting schedule, which shows that 4,446, I believe, police officers are the ones that were approved uh, for voting through the post. And not all of them were at the infamous rest camp that he continually refers to. This was across the country. So the attribution of those votes in this affidavit to say some of the very votes should therefore be nullified, again, is no logical connection to what was happening. It is just thrown in there again to say this is another number, knock it off. He doesn't even say how does that link to his own election. Were those police officers going to vote for him? Were they not going to vote for him? It, it's all very vague. It's all very general. It is supported by no evidence. There's no police officer that has come before you and said, uh, last five minutes to conclude. Uh, yes, uh, what time would you? Five. 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 Uh, well, maybe not between the parties before you now, but the way that the order operates is such that it is effectively in the form of a declarator because if the court decides that it is the ballot is legal, anyone else who comes to challenge will still have to face the same hurdle, and it's unlikely that the court will overturn itself at that point. Now, what is the sum of what we have said? The sum of what we have said is this. There's no application before you. The rules have not been complied with. The figures do not justify what the applicant says they do. He mischaracterizes Alex Yazet, the statistical report. He attributes votes for teachers that are not established or by any evidence at all. He uses the wrong voter turnout to claim that 700,000 votes are unaccounted for. He uses and mischaracterizes V11 forms before the court to say they were forged, they were missed, they were blank, and so on and so forth. Now, the only other issue that probably I should deal with is that of the missing polling stations before I, I take my seat. They say there were polling stations that were created, there were polling stations that went missing. In the entire address by the applicant, not a single name of a polling station has been given to say polling station so and so disappeared, or polling station so and so was created. What they do in the affidavit, my lords and my ladies, is to say 
this is to say examples of busy changing results, but examples are only responding to a petition, it was reacting to a petition. And in that reaction, Zeki had to meet the allegations head on. And to do so, Zeki had to go back into his data and see what exactly is being claimed and is it true. Now in that process, that's why these minor and immaterial data capture errors were discovered. They are not attending Alex Z, and their effect is indicated as being non-significant to the final declaration. Now, what is before you, my Lord Chief Justice, and many viewers and ladies, is a request to overturn an election return. That request must meet certain thresholds, and it is our submission that that threshold has not been met by the applicant. The applicant can go to town and say, well, you are changing results, you are doing this and you are doing that, but eventually the evidentiary burden of proof that must be achieved is to say, okay, when we take into account whatever minor clinical errors were discovered, does it change anything? Does it change the declaration? Does it change the result of the election? It does not. The result of the election remains as was declared. The first respondent, on the results that are there, the results that are true, won the election. The applicant, if he if alleges that there's something in the ballot boxes, well, he ought to have opened them and said, well, he has the smoking gun. Look at it and see what they say. But he did not do it. And so he must rely on the data from them. What about the issue, the allegation pertaining to West Central, the alleged uh, apparently influx of voters beyond 6 p.m.? My lady, that, that particular point can be answered in, uh, in conjunction with the general point that is made by the applicant that there were anomalous voter. Uh, behavior or voter turnouts in certain areas. Now, the first thing that must be understood is that the reasons why voters behave in the way they do is not something that can be subjected to pure statistical analysis. Voters behave the way they do, no one knows why, maybe behavioral scientists may be able to answer the question if they study it. This is why the commission cannot be taken to task to say, how is the voter turnout in North Central at this particular level and not at that particular level. Because the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission does not go out and seek voters to come and vote. Simply facilitates the casting of the ballots. If the voter has decided to come at a particular time, that has nothing to do with the Electoral Commission. But more importantly, it is an issue that again goes back to the ballot boxes. If you say that in a constituent province that has a voter population in excess of 500,000 and you accept that there was a voter turnout in the own papers of at least 72%, then you must also accept that there will be an influx of voters that comes up to about 380 something thousand on their own calculation. On the correct computation, upon 85.1%. For that amount, it comes up to something in excess of 400,000. The logic of it is clear. It is supported by the data that was received all over the country, the voter turnout all over the country. There is no real basis that is placed before the court to say, look, they could never have been this many people in West Central who voted. And again, it's clear how they went about sampling these polling stations to find out with what time this number of voters had come in and so on, again it goes to the particularity or lack thereof in the petition. If the applicant wanted to prove that less than existed 200,000 voters voted in West Central, his best work. Mr. Kalangani, there's, there's the event which I don't think you addressed, that several polling stations showed identical results. Thank you, Lord. We do address that issue in our opposing papers. We actually annex uh, 
is just opposed with the number of bars that we actually used, which are counted and verified before the unsealing of the ballot box and counting of the ballots in the box. So if everyone who is there, the agents, the observers and so on, find that the ballot paper account that they have done differs from what they find in the ballot box, then that is the first red flag that they raise to say, well, you have received 100 ballot papers, you used 50, but now in the ballot box there are 60 ballots. Where did the 10 come from? That's the evidence that the applicant should have brought and said, well, this is what accounts for the 40,000. This is the inflated or stuffing of ballots that happened. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't present us with any of his election agents who say, when we did the ballot paper audit before counting, we discovered that what we audited was not the same as what we found in the ballot box. In the ballot box, we found more ballot papers than were used on the ballot paper account. There are no observers who make note of any such anomaly. It is an anomaly that the applicant simply throws and says, well, there is a difference, therefore there must be something wrong, there must be something irregular. But it does not give you evidence or any kind of particularity as to why he says so. And in our respectful view, this would have been proven simply by looking at the few levels that are in in the boxes and saying, well, this ballot paper account does not match the number of ballots that you counted. Or bringing agents who will say, well, this is what happened. There are none that are brought. Do I understand you to say that evidence to explain this ruling is available when it is in the ballot boxes? Is that the position you effectively, my lady? That's where it is. We found that in those ballot boxes, the applicant will find no joy at all in his allegations. The allegation that there, in some places there are more votes than um, uh, the registered number of voters? You know, that is the issue that I related to when I took the court through an um which Yes, which terminates the various polling stations that the applicant alleges there was over voting. And we put the evidence to the court to show that there was no over voting. And the verification by SIG on a schedule for each province. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Kamande, for having taken us, taken us uh, through the uh, position for the last uh, three respondents. Uh, there are no more respondents with the primary uh, cases. We will now go back to the applicant and give uh, Mr. Kofu the opportunity to reply. Thank you, my lord. Let me begin with the position of the first respondent. In terms of time, uh, much in terms of time. So are you, the rule, the rule 41. So you start with the rule 41 for replies. Just let me know. Can you know, ask for time if you want. Uh, but that was in five minutes. Yes. Um, but the only thing, well, I'm going to ask for more time. I'm going to ask for more time. I need a lot. I will. If you want time, if you want more time, uh, I will just ask for it in advance. So I will just ask for it in advance. Like the way they are. Uh, maybe if I could try some 20 minutes? 15 minutes. 20 minutes, given that there are two respondents. Ten, what time do you want? 20 minutes. 20. 20 minutes. All right, right. we'll give you 20. Thank you. So, I'm going to ask for you to reply. Thank you. All right. I'm going to be in the position of the first respondent. First respondent. Uh, this is a situation where the 
circumstances of human creation, salvations, no shadows are away from the numbers. Jesus is or David Abbey in this case. He prefers to die with the case that is on before the court. The page 29 uh, of the Quran is a part of the set out the rights of his family. You can see the day that she does. He wishes to be in the smart of him, both the process perspective and also from a mathematical perspective. It's true that she sets out a background because that the subsidy are challenged. But for the issue of the issue of the issue of the this process issues the numbers and the first respondent who claims to have won the election just as we want to deal with that. I take the court for a win to the judgment in China Drive uh, versus Mugabe. The court says they are very cautious of the fact that elections can be stolen, like this one. They are acutely aware of the possibility that a candidate will pass as far after losing an election where, after all, he will have the truth on his or his side. If a candidate can as far, on a certain and given basis, it is incumbent upon the respondent to try and meet that candidate on that, on that basis. The elections submit that the allegations of a criminal nature in the test is one beyond a uh, reasonable doubt. There is no warrant for that kind of position uh, in our law. But we will just make this point. If it appears to the court that there has been a genuine error, and the genuine error has given a candidate a voice that is not entitled to, the court will set aside that election on that simple basis. So when there is a mathematical challenge, it becomes important that parties deal with that issue. Now when ZEC starts revising its own figures, the presumption of regularity goes away. We must now deal with the figures that it places before the court and let ZEC establish the validity of those that should come to that. I just wish to explain that the issue of the second bundle, on which much is said, is completely irrelevant. We have our objections on how that bundle was treated, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. The applicant's uh, fundamental challenge is process and mathematics based. I go to the question of the residue. Section 70, subsection 3 of the Electoral Act clearly deals with a parliamentary election, it, 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 it is so clear. But then there is a judgment on the issue. Orlando, 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 on which much is said, is completely irrelevant. We have our objections on how that bundle was treated, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. The applicant's uh, fundamental challenge is process is is process.
teachers who are signing the demonstration. And the teachers are going to be in Texas to their freedom.